my name is David Lesher. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Lesher. I am the uh, Government Affairs Director at PPIC, the Public Policy Institute of California. And uh, there's still some people taking their seats, but I think we'll get started because we have quite a show and a lot of ground to cover today. There's still some seats up front here if anybody wants to um, sit down instead of standing in the back. Um, and uh, before we get started, I'm just going to make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first of all, this event is part of a, a series of uh, briefings that we do in Sacramento, uh, funded by the James Irvine Foundation. It's the Irvine, Irvine Foundation Briefing Series. And so just wanted to say thank you to them for, for sponsoring this event. Um, also, a little bit about the format today. Uh, first, I will introduce uh, our researcher, Magnus Lofstrom, who's going to give us a kind of presentation and overview of the issue of realignment in public safety and the shift of responsibility of so many offenders from the state level to the local level and what that means. Um, uh, and then we're going to have a panel discussion to uh, a very expert, a good expert panel to just explore some of the major questions on this very important topic. Uh, a couple of quick announcements first. On your chair, there should be a a package that has some of the work that we've done recently on this topic, as well as um, an evaluation form uh, that if you wanted to fill it out at the end and, and leave it at the desk on the way out, that would be very much appreciated. You could tell us how we did. Um, also, this uh, event is being uh, live streamed, and I know there's an audience of, of at least some local people, local officials around the state watching this, uh, as well as uh, my mother is watching, so. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's, um, and, uh, and also just wanted to say that the, the slides that we'll be using will also be on our website, as are the reports that, uh, that were released this week and that are part of today's presentation. And the website is ppic.org. So um, let me introduce Magnus Lofstrom to come up and give a presentation, and then I'll come back up and we'll moderate the panel. Uh, Magnus is a research fellow at PPIC. And he's done a lot of work on corrections recently, but is also a uh, work in immigration and labor force issues. Um, he is an economist with a PhD from UC, UC San Diego. So please welcome Magnus Lofstrom. Thank you, Dave, and, and thank you all for coming here today on, on this uh, very hot day, and uh, fingers crossed that the air conditioning is, is working here. Um, so what I want to do is I'll, I want to start off by giving you a very quick overview of, of realignment and share with you some of our uh, observations and, and findings in the research that we've done recently. And, and as Dave pointed out, you have a, a packet with uh, four different publications that will provide you uh, information on uh, much, much more detailed information than what I'll be able to cover in these 10 or so minutes uh, coming up. Um, and hopefully this, this is, the intent uh, here is that this is gonna provide, uh, you know, uh, raise some of the issues that I, I think are certainly worthy of, of a uh, discussion, so. Um, it is not an overstatement by saying that realignment is a major corrections reform, and in fact, I think many people will argue that this is one of the most important corrections reforms that the state has seen uh, in decades. Um, it was prompted by a federal court order uh, to reduce our prison overcrowding um, by, at the time, of about 35,000. Uh, the state appealed this, uh, but it was upheld by the Supreme Court in 2011. And really what the state's solution to this problem was, uh, rather than relying on, on early releases of prisoners, uh, the solution was really to shift responsibility as well as funding from the state to the counties. And in particularly how we handle lower level felons. So these are felons that are described as nonviolent, non-sexual, and non-serious. And the way we did this is, is I'm, I'm just going to be able to show you the uh, kind of the main, some of the main features of this uh, particular reform. 
one important one was that lower level felons are now going to county jails instead of our state prisons. So that's obviously one important way that this is going to relieve uh, the pressures from our state prison system. Another important uh, feature of the reform was the technical parole violators, who in the past would have been sent back to our state prisons, are now going to receive their sanctions at the counties. So this is another important group, and that was a su substantial uh, proportion of the prison population. So this is, again, it's an important feature of this legislation. Um, Another a key component here is how we're handling the supervision of released offenders. And released offenders now, uh, again, we're talking about the lower level felons, the, instead of being handled and supervised by state parole, they're now being supervised by county probations. The reform, it was uh, proposed and implemented very quickly. It went from proposal to implementation in, in just about eight or nine months. Proposal in January of 2011, implementation in, as of October 1st of that same year. It quickly drew down the prison population. In just the first year, it drew down by about 27,000, which represents about 17% uh, of the state prison population. So again, this is, we're talking about a major reform here. So with that in mind, and the structure of this legislation, it is not surprising to see that the county jails are receiving a lot of new customers. Uh, we see an increase in the county jail population since realignment in that first year, which brings us up to the most recent data point we have at the moment. Uh, it increased by about 9,000, which is a, an increase in the average daily jail population of about 9%. Uh, uh, substantial increase, quick increase. We're still actually below our historical highs that were around 84,000. Now we're in the low 80s, and the highs of 84,000 uh, was really in, uh, in 2007. The increase, again, maybe not surprisingly, has also presented some challenges for the county jails. Um, and this is a system that was already uh, capacity challenged at the time of realignment. And just to give you some examples and indications of this, we have 18 counties who now face court-ordered uh, population caps, so how many inmates they can house in their facilities. Um, we have 16 counties operating facilities above their rated capacities, and that's up from 11 in just one year. If we look at this on a system-wide perspective, so statewide, we see that in every month since February of 2012 that uh, our jails have been operating above 100% of their rated capacity. These challenges are also noticeable in, uh, in the data when we look at capacity-constrained releases. So these are releases that the sheriffs are reporting are due to limited housing capacity. And we see that in the most recent uh, period that we have data for, we see that 35 counties reported releasing inmates uh, due to capacity constraints. And that's up from 27 in the previous year. Another indication uh, of the challenges that the uh, jails are facing is that they're now dealing with a, a population of inmates that are serving much longer sentences than they did prior to realignment. The max prior to realignment was one year. Now there is more than 1,100 inmates who are serving sentences of five years or more. There are concerns about the, uh, um, the conditions in jail as well, and this is something that we see, uh, but just looking at, um, at uh, some lawsuits or, uh, or uh, some threats of lawsuits. So four counties have actually been issued or threatened with a lawsuit since realignment. So if we then, if we take a step back and we take a look at what the responses at the county level are uh, with respect to a realignment, and particularly what I'm doing here is I'm really going to give you some brief points and come some of the key findings from uh, one of the reports that's in your package that was co-authored with Steve Raphael, who's here, who's at uh, UC Berkeley, who's a professor there. Uh, what we do see is, as expected, uh, total incarceration increased in the state. Um, uh, the, we do not have a one-to-one -one relationship, as the data that I already showed you kind of hints at. Instead, what we see is that the county jail population increased by about one for every three fewer felons going to our state prisons. Um, 
also one of the, uh, the uh, uh, effects of, uh, of realignment is that our county incarceration rates are now more equal across, the, uh, uh, across counties. There are huge disparities still uh, in terms of our prison and total incarceration rate, but realignment reduced those differences. As with so many of the other responses to realignment, as we expected, and the intent of this legislation was for counties to take the approaches that they deemed best. And when we look at the jails and the uh, incarceration responses, we see that these two differ dramatically across the counties. And in trying to explain what some of those factors are, the one that stands out the most are really the one that's hinting at capacity constraints. So here are just a couple of, of, of uh, observations that suggest that. Um, if we look at these uh, capacity constrained releases, something that took place right, uh, before uh, realignment that has certainly increased, the data quite strongly show this, we see that these take place primarily in the counties that are facing court ordered caps. And it's particularly sentence inmates that are released early in these counties uh, that are taking place much more frequently now as a result of realignment. We do see that in this environment of capacity challenges that some counties are using their, uh, some of the discretions and tools that they've been handed, such as a new sentencing tool that's called split sentencing. So split sentencing allows the counties and the judge to divide the term and the sentence into a portion that's being served in the county jail and another portion that's then going to be under supervision of county probation. And we do see that in some of the capacity constrained counties that this is something that's used. But at the same time, we see other capacity constrained counties that are not using this. So this is something that I think it's important for us to try to start to understand uh, why that is. Uh, it is a tool that could be used to relieve some of the pressures that the county jails are facing. So we should also take a look and see what this situation will look like down the road. Um, I'm pointing out that right now there are some serious capacity challenges, but the state has provided funding for jail expansions, both through, uh, through AB 900 as well as SB 1022. And with these additional expansions that will be uh, built in the coming years, uh, that will certainly alleviate the pressures of, of the jails to some extent. Not only will it do that, but it will also provide these upgraded facilities and some infrastructure that hopefully will lend itself better to programming and services and hence better outcomes. It wasn't just the jails that, uh, that have been facing these new responsibilities in a dramatic fashion. We see that happening as well with the county probations. Uh, it shifted quite dramatically the responsibility and the supervision of lower level felons uh, from parole to county probation. And we see here quite quickly uh, and, and, and obvious uh, how that happened. The state parole population, for example, declined in just the first year from 127,000 to about 73,000 in that first year alone. And if we look at after that first year, what the new uh, caseload for the county probations are uh, in terms of the post-release community supervision, we see that that stands at about 34,000 after one year. And then there's also an additional 3,300 on mandatory supervision. So these are uh, released offenders who received a split sentence who are then uh, upon release being supervised by county uh, probation. But having said that, I think that there's one uh, important point here that, that, that's certainly worthy of discussion. And that is that most realigned felons who are serving their time in jail are not receiving a split sentence. About three quarters of them will be released without any supervision. I think that's an important point and something to uh, keep in mind and, and, and as I said, worth having a discussion. Let me end by just pointing out that uh, uh, realignment certainly is, is uh, uh, represents something that presents both challenges and opportunities. Um, it does provide an opportunity to shift from our costly incarceration that was taking place in our state prison, uh, prisons to local approaches that are stressing more of the evidence-based practices. Um, I think it's important that we uh, consider and, 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 and uh, pay attention to what realignment is doing in terms of overcrowding in the jails to make sure that we didn't simply uh, shift the, uh, the problem of lawsuits from the state to the counties. 
One of the, uh, the issues that's most commonly discussed when it comes to realignment is, of course, the concern uh, that it has a negative impact on public safety. And the focus of these discussions has really been the one that's uh, pointing out that, well, with less incarceration, there's more street time for offenders. And the concern is that they will participate in, in more crime. Um, I think that one of the things that we need to keep in mind and as we move forward here is that recognizing that our jails are crowded, there are a number of releases that are taking place because of those capacity constraints. In order to minimize any negative effect, it points towards the need to really identify uh, the individuals who are of the least and lowest risk to reoffend and hence minimize their negative impact on public safety. But it's also pointing towards an opportunity here that if we can identify what the, uh, the most effective evidence-based practices are that works in our communities um, and we can identify the offenders who can benefit from these as well as then providing these services uh, as well as treatment and programming, that that's going to be an opportunity to reduce reoffending. And we had a very high uh, recidivism rate in California. So this will be something as well that uh, might very well uh, benefit the state in terms of public safety. And last one is, is one of the big unknowns. And that is that even with the impressive drawdown in the prison population of 27,000, as I said, in the first year, and it's level off, we don't really see any further uh, reductions. Um, we're still nine to 10,000 short of the mandate that the three uh, judge panel issued. And the question is, what are the solutions going to be to handle this population? And how is that gonna impact the counties? All right, so with that, uh, let me invite uh, Dave back up here as well as our panel. And I'm gonna let Dave uh, introduce our panelists here, so thank you. Thank you very much, Magnus. Um, I just wanted to give a quick recognition to some of our other uh, researchers on our public safety team here. Um, uh, Mia Bird and Sonia Tapoya are here today. Um, Reichen Grete, uh, Steve R Raphael, um, and then uh, there are some others back at the back at the headquarters. Uh, let's see, Joe Hayes and Brandon Martin, and um, and some others. Uh, point being that PPIC is doing a lot of work in this area and. Um, made a pretty good investment and has some really good studies underway. So this is, uh, there'll be more to follow this. this. Um, also uh, recognize Donna Lucas, a chair of the board at PPIC. She's here today, so. Um, so I, I got up this morning and I saw, uh, I looked at the Capitol Alert from Sacramento Bee like I always do, and the headline on the article was, is realignment working? And I thought, perfect timing, just for a second, and, and then I realized that the that this event is supposed to answer that question, and not only that, but we get going. <laughs> the article said that we were going to cut through the noise and provide concrete consequences okay. of uh, of AB 109 and realignment in California. So, so we have a lot of work to do here on this panel, but we are lucky to have a, a very good panel for this discussion. Um, some of the uh, key personalities and representatives and some of the major perspectives on, on a real uh, paradigm shift in, in corrections uh, legislation and, and uh, policy here in California. So I will introduce the panel right away and then we'll get to uh, a, a discussion that I will moderate with a couple of questions and then uh, hope to look uh, for some questions from the audience in the, at the end. Um, first, I'll introduce uh, Senator Lonnie Hancock, who is uh, seated next to the podium here. Uh, Senator Hancock. Hello. Oh, there you go. Oh. <laughs> They're not going to do that to me, and I'm going to feel important. <laughs> Senator Hancock has been in the legislature for more than 10 years and was mayor of Berkeley previously. Uh, she also is uh, currently the chair of the Senate Public Safety Committee, as well as the Budget Subcommittee that oversees. Um, uh, corrections and public safety. So, uh, very important uh, job in this area. Uh, next is uh, Linda Penner, who has uh, worked at the Fresno County Probation Department for a long time, I think uh, over 30 years actually, and, and for the last uh, eight years uh, served as Chief Probation Officer, former President of the Chief Probation Officers Association for the state, and 
and just recently appointed by the governor to be the executive director of the Board of State and Community Corrections, which many of you may know is, uh, uh, was created by AB 109 as an organization to help uh, implement and oversee uh, realignment in California. Um, very good job. Oh, <laughs> And uh, next is Matt Cade, who brings uh, several different perspectives and hats to this, to this discussion today. To, he's currently the executive director of the California State Association of Counties, uh, and previously uh, was the secretary for corrections under two previous governors, Governor Brown and Schwarzenegger, or I guess one current governor and one previous governor, um, but has obviously been through uh, a lot of this issue as it evolved at the state level and then now at the local level. So. Please welcome Matt Cain. And uh, Sheriff Adam Christensen uh, is the sheriff in Stanislaus County, where he's elected in 2006. Um, and uh, he is also the vice president of the California State Sheriff's Association. So I want to begin. Um, I'll pick up where the, the Sacramento Bee left me off this morning. Uh, and I, I'll start with, um, well, why don't I start with the, the sheriff on, on that end of the panel. Um, just the, the question is, is, is realignment working in California? Wow, I get to go first. <laughs> First of all, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today, and, and my thanks to the PPIC and everybody in the room who decided to come together and talk about what I would term as a paradigm shift in criminal justice in California. Um, it's probably no secret that I wasn't one of the biggest fans of realignment and uh, testified as an intervener and was very concerned about the safety of the community and our quality of life issues and a variety of other things associated with this. But uh, that being said, um, we own it, it's here, and I think that collectively as leaders throughout the state, our communities, our counties, uh, we have an obligation to uh, come together and do our best to make this work. Um, to answer the question, too soon to tell. Uh, I think that uh, all of this is uh, very much like trying to drink from a fire hose. Uh, it came very quickly, very fast. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, but I do believe that we have the ability to make this work. But it's based upon collaboration, communication, partnerships, adequate sustainable funding, adequate local facilities. Um, and it's not just jail beds. I, I want to I make that clear. We're not building jail beds locally for the purposes of incarceration. Um, we're very fortunate in Stanislaus County. We're building beds under AB 900, but it includes uh, programming space, a 72-bed medical mental health care unit, a 14,000-square-foot day reporting center where we can invite our community-based organizations to partner with us in an effort to provide educational, vocational, and rehabilitative opportunities. Am I still concerned about the safety of the community? Yes, I am. Do we have the opportunity to try to make this work? Yes, we do. Do we have a lot of work left to do? Yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, Matt, is realignment, uh, what do we know, what do we, what's working, what's not working? Uh, well, it's a lot easier to run the prison system now than it used to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> say that for sure. Uh, and, and that's no small thing, right? Even in my new chair, I, th I look at the prison system, obviously, um, with a, a great deal of concern because it's, uh, you know, it's something I used to tell the sheriff and the chief, it's our prison system, and it has to work for all Californians. Uh, and it was broken, and part of the reason it was broken is it was horribly overcrowded. And so, you know, you could know that offender A needed to be in a drug treatment program in order not to reoffend next time, and you could know there was a great one in, you know, this prison over here in Northern California, but if there's no bed, there's no bed. And so that prisoner sits in Southern California, gets no treatment, and comes out and does the same thing over and over again. And that was a cycle I think was bad for everyone. So uh, while um, you know the courts and at least I and would disagree about whether it's been enough, it certainly is uh, much better than it was before. So, so there, the reason I say that is that I think the ultimate answer to the question is realignment is working in some areas, uh, in some places, better than others. Um, and so uh, prison and parole, I think 
you know, we have a, a much more healthy prison and parole system than we ever had before. So set that aside. Um, counties is a, is a mixed bag, right? And so in places that we're dealing with crowding problems before realignment, um, I look to the folks on my right and left, it's a problem. And until jails get built, until the chiefs are able to build up capacity for uh, both in terms of the number of officers they have super, supervising people and the number of programs that they're able to put these folks in for rehabilitation, it's going to exacerbate problems that existed already. And that's, that's, a, you know, that's a way of saying it's not working in, in some areas. Now, we may look five years from now and say, all right, it's, it's already leveling. But you know, we may get some things done in terms of construction or in terms of, of training and, um, and in terms of hiring that, that help, even in these other areas. But you, know, you go to some counties, which I have uh, in my new role, and they will tell you they think realignment's, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's actually working better than what they had before. And they really cite, those counties cite two things. Um, number one, the additional influx of cash in a healthy system has allowed those law enforcement leaders to do more things that they wanted to do already. And number two, it has in some places brought law enforcement leadership together for the first time in the community corrections partnerships to think jointly about common problems. And so those two benefits, I think, have, have really helped uh, statewide. Mm -hmm. So it's correct to say not all counties started equal to begin with. And some face more challenges from realignment than others. Yeah, well, I didn't understand, as the Secretary of Corrections, just um, how diverse the situations were in California's counties. I don't think it's possible to understand until you've really walked in their shoes. Um, the same thing is true with the Affordable Care Act. As we you know, talk about health care in California, there are some counties that are in a much better position in terms of uh, dealing with uh, the uninsured than others and, and all those kinds of issues. So it's really, it's not just law enforcement, but the truth is, is it really is a, a diverse situation out there. Mm -hmm. So Linda Penner, is it working or what do we know about what's working and what's not? The... Uh, <clears throat> too soon to tell, I'm gonna borrow an answer from my colleague down at the end of the table. But what I can tell you is um, it has not been catastrophic. The sky has not fallen. Uh, there have been incidents where bad things happened, uh, but bad things were happening before. And at the end of the day, we weren't going to cure that or exacerbate that in many ways with realignment. So I think we have to face the music on that. There are incidences all over the state of California where some things are going very well. Probation uh, has uh, been underfunded in the adult world for, uh, since 1977. And I, if you all remember your history, back in 1977, we had determinate sentencing come along. And interestingly enough, same governor. So we, we had uh, determinate, <laughs> but, but when I worked for him in September, I will never repeat that again. But, uh, uh, but uh, and, and I'm not saying that was a bad thing. I mean, that, that played a role for that period of time. But what we saw is that as, uh, as the sentence, the, the prisons became, uh, uh, more populated, the adult uh, probation world became less funded. And so um, I think we're, you know, experiencing some of the fallout of that happening year over year. And when I look back at realignment, um, uh, I think probation is absolutely up for the job. I think they uh, know how to hold people accountable and at the same time know how to gear people to life changes and, and how to uh, find them ways into programs and talk to them about life skills and motivate them to move away from a lifestyle that is not working for them, obviously. Uh, we demonstrated that with 678. Remember, that was the, the precursor to realignment. That's when uh, uh, the, the powers that be at that time, it was Secretary Kate came up uh, uh, with uh, an equation wherein uh, individuals that were on felony probation that no longer went um, to CDCR, we were able to split uh, the, the benefit of that cost-wise. And when they funded adult probation appropriately with 678, we had a number of uh, positive outcomes from that. So am I uh, down in the dumps about realignment? 
Uh, no. Did I wish for realignment for Christmas that year I was president of the Chiefs? No. Uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, sometimes, uh, and you all heard this, crisis can be the mother of invention. And I think that's where we're at. We, we had a crisis. We had to react to that crisis. I think we did that as uh, uh, gracefully as we could, as thoughtful as we could. Do we need more thought? Yes. Do we need to find ways to uh, tweak an incredibly historic, aggressive change in the way we did business in the California uh, criminal justice system? Yes. Uh, but I think the state's up for it. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. And Senator Hancock, how do you think it's going? Especially, I mean, if it's if it sounds like it may be too soon to tell, are you surprised that it might be too um, soon to tell? Or actually, think? I I think that. For a paradigm shift, as the sheriff said, in the way we think about, organize, and fund a major public system, it is going extraordinarily well. Sure, we have a few counties that really want to turn back the clock. Their representatives come to my committee with a bill <laughs> every couple of weeks to send more prisoners back to the state. Uh, never, by the way, followed by any of the money that the state <laughs> put in the Constitution for them, but to erode realignment. And we've been watching that, and I'm happy to say that that hasn't happened. But many more are stepping up to the plate and really re-looking at how they manage their jails, how they think about their corrections problems, and doing a remarkable job. And then there are some counties that did quite well originally, and they are thriving with this. And um, I think that one of the really good things about realignment is that it has allowed us to isolate some of the challenges. We understand them a little better a year and a half in. And I would say that jail management is a major problem. We have counties releasing people <laughs> Um, early who don't use risk assessments. Now, you know, there are easy things that we can do to get a better managed jail system. And then we can also look at the fact that jails have traditionally not really done rehabilitation. Um, by far the largest number of people in any county jail are pretrial people who can't make bail. So we know we have to look at bail, we have to look at sentencing, uh, we have to look at risk assessments, but at least we know that now. And um, I, I just wanted to point out, you know, change is always hard. It's always hard. And if any of you ever, I, in a former life, I was a graduate student in social psychology, and they used to say, change is painful. People never change unless continuing the way they are is more painful than the pain of change. And we were there in California. We had an internationally recognized failed prison system and correction system. Um, and uh, the US Supreme Court said we had to change that. And we are, and it's pretty amazing. But I also want to point out, this isn't just us. This is the Wall Street Journal one week ago today. Um, as budgets, as prison squeeze budgets, GOP rethink, rethinks crime focus. There is an organization right now called Right on Crime, led by Newt Gingrich and a number of other people. They're operating in a number of states. Their goal, increase rehabilitation and um, relieve the pressure on our prisons and jails. So I think we're part of a great effort and look forward to working with all these very good and creative people on it. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to ask about this, the state's role in, in realignment. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, obviously, Proposition 30 locked in funding for realignment. And so there's obviously a, a funding responsibility. I think, uh, you know, the questions, the broader questions are about whether um, there, should the state monitor what's happening? Should it, uh, should there be an expectation about some kind of level of performance or, or uh, what should the state's role be uh, in, in uh, uh, something that's happening so much at the local level? And, um, you know, Linda Penner, I'd like to start with you because the BSEC is, um, this is, the state put this organization together partly for this purpose, um, to oversee 
the implementation of AB 109 in realignment. Um, and the, obviously your board is mostly local officials, but it's a state organization. So just wonder what your perspective is on what the state's role should be in realignment. Well, uh, thank you for the tightrope. I think I'll really <laughs> enjoy it. Let, let me start by saying this. I think that the BSCC has an enormous job ahead of them. I think that uh, data collection and, uh, and the various uh, disciplines coming together and being able to uh, uh, roll out a meaningful uh, system that measures outcomes and, uh, and uh, reflects uh, cost-saving analysis and does the many, many things that we look to data to do is important and imperative. Uh, on the other uh, side of the coin, I'm still a local, and I'll be a local until, you know, I, uh, close to <laughs> September when I come to work. And so, as a local, what I choose to tell you is that the locals took on the workload, and they are doing the job. And so, do we want to be uh, legislated and mandated by the state for an obligation that we took on? Uh, I think there will be some pushback to that. So the BSCC's job, the challenge is going to be, is allowing the locals to come together and move uh, towards the outcomes we want with data and being able to measure what's going on and have a, uh, a meaningful uh, uh, number of data points that tell us something about realignment. The concern is always by the locals that the state's going to give us the obligation and come back and tell us uh, craft the way that we need to uh, get that obligation done. So there is a, a serious, uh, serious coming together that has to begin uh, as we roll out, you know, how we're going to accomplish that enormous mission. With that said, realignment's created that environment, I think, that was referenced earlier uh, by Matt, which is the CCP has come together. And those CCPs uh, in all 58 counties have crafted, they are the, they are the justice uh, experts in their communities, and they've crafted plans. I, in the near future, you're going to see that report on all of those plans come to you. And I think what you're going to see are counties have uh, put forth an incredible effort to provide alternatives to incarceration and evidence-based practices and assessments and, and has demonstrated their ability to take uh, a very big job, bring it down to the local level where we are nimble and able to change and, and craft our own destinies there and do that with uh, the reality in mind that we cannot incarcerate ourselves out of this mess. And I, I really feel an obligation to say that because uh, that's where the work came. I like the way the panel was made up because at the end of the day, it's the CAOs, the Board of Supervisors, the Sheriffs, the Probation Departments, and the other stakeholders that are shouldering this. Do I think we have to be accountable in terms of our data and our outcomes? Absolutely. But it will have to be a partnership. It cannot be something that uh, we are, uh, the locals are in the receiving position on. Mm -hmm. and Senator, I wonder if you could speak next to that. What, it, what, is sure. this, what should the state do going um, forward? I agree with that. I think um, as a state, yeah. uh, we're interested in outcomes and there will be um, counties that do a great job and counties that may continue to fail. And what we need uh, really is accurate, usable information so that we know how counties are doing and we can help the counties that need help uh, with some of the best practices that have actually decreased the jail population in some of our counties. Uh, even with realignment. So um, what I hope that we're going to, the state role will be, and what the state needs is accurate, user-friendly information with definitions that are apples and apples, not apples and oranges, so that we can really see how it's coming. And the other thing I think I see as the state's role is incentives. Um, Linda mentioned um, SB 678. We were able to realign that with realignment in the state budget so that we're now going to make it applicable also to counties as they work with their realigned populations, which means if you have success, you get half the savings, essentially. And uh, we also were able to fund in the budget pi a pilot program in three counties it's going to be San Francisco, Marin, San Mateo, and LA. 
to um, uh, to have felons come back from state prison 90 days in advance so they really can be hooked up to all the benefits that can help them succeed, jobs, housing, and some of the other things. If that works, hopefully it'll be something that other counties can use. I'd like to see financial incentives too because I bet you in Stanislaus County there's going to be something and in Fresno County um, and one size doesn't fit all. We know that. So um, I think our role should be um, looking for results, not, not handing you minutia. I agree. I look forward to being partners with you, as I said. Thank you. And Sheriff, I wonder if I can jump to you. What do you think you need from the state to make this work in Stanislaus County? Well, I'm pleased to hear the senator say that she agrees with us. That's great. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the state really truly needs to be a partner in this, not a dictator in this. Unfunded mandates do nothing for us. Um, and again, when you're looking at this type of paradigm shift, what you really want to do is have all the partners and stakeholders come together and say, okay, this is where we're at. Give, it, give us some time to manage this, get to a manageable level, and then what, what adjustments do we need to make? So that's really, in my mind, the state's role uh, is more of a, of a partnership than anything else. Um, I want to digress just for a moment back to a comment the senator made about programming. And of course, I can't speak for 58 counties, but prior to realignment, Stanislaus County was actively engaged and involved in programming. Uh, we've had partnerships, strong partnerships, with many community-based organizations, um, service, civic, charitable, faith-based business, education, agriculture, uh, you name it, in providing literacy, literacy uh, one more time, literacy services, <laughs> Um, education, helping people graduate, get GEDs. Uh, we've got a very robust vocational training program with Modesto City Schools that teaches uh, a, a welding trade, a welding vocational program, and then we partner uh, with our business partners to help people find jobs. So we've always been engaged and involved in efforts to reduce rec recidivism because we operate, Stanislaus County operates under a federal consent decree. I'm one of those counties that's capped and we had a local jail bed capacity problem before realignment came along. And so right now, with a jail that was built in the 50s, it was never designed back then to do with it what we're doing today. It wasn't designed with programming in mind. Um, fortunately, we were able to, to get a newer facility in 1992, and again, now prospectively, we're looking at building in public safety infrastructure. But our jail is jail. Um, and so that's a little bit of a dynamic, but without those community-based organizations, without that ability to have access to, again, educational, vocational, and rehabilitative opportunities, the problem just exacerbates itself, and that's really what we're trying to avoid. So as an example, in simple numbers, if you get sentenced to 365 days in jail right now today in Stanislaus County, under realignment, you're going to get 50% of that off, good and work time credit, so you're down to 180. And because of our ADP, um, we provide another 70% credit on top of that. So you're going to do 54 days. Now, we divert a lot of people to alternative work programs, alternatives to incarceration. But more importantly, we're not just focused on sentenced inmates. A lot of our efforts and partnerships are focused on people who are in custody, pretrial detainees, because we want them to have the same access to services even before they finish their journey through the criminal justice system, giving them opportunities to break cycles of addiction and violence. So our focus is, is ADP-wide, <coughs> not just sentenced inmates in our custody, because managing jails and managing ADP is an everyday, all day, 24 hour a day process. From managing your, your population cap to managing classification of inmate, to ensure the safety and security of your facilities, to making sure that conditions of confinement uh, were ahead of that because of the lawsuits that follow uh, from this realigned population, which I'm all about mitigating risk and liability. Adequate and proper inmate medical and mental health care. We have a tremendous partnership with our behavioral health and recovery resources team, with the courts, even with a local medical center, doctor's medical center, who stepped up to the plate and said, bring them to us. Even though the county has a contract because the county closed its county health facility or medical facility years ago, 
and yes, Doctors Medical Center has a contract for indigent health care, the CEO went one step further and said for law enforcement encountering mentally ill offenders, bring them to us. It's tremendous. If you build those kind of community partnerships, this will be successful. And, I've, and you know, in the discussions that I've had <coughs> about, you know, what's the message for success? What do we need to do to be successful? Really, it's about adequate, sustainable funding. It's about capacity, which means facilities locally and programming space. It's about collaboration and partnerships. It's about flexibility and a willingness to amend what we've already uh, started. And uh, it's certainly about accountability and consequence because we've also discovered that in order for people to be successful in these programs, there has to be some level of, of accountability and consequence. They're not going to want to participate and be successful just because they choose to do it. You don't see that very often. There, there's no really will to, to break cycles of addiction and violence. You have to have some a level of accountability and consequence. So, you know, I think that the state uh, is a great partner. Uh, certainly the state sheriffs have had an excellent relationship with the governor and his staff. You know, we'll make this thing work, but again, too soon to tell, and we really have to have the flexibility locally in partnership with our probation chiefs and the DA and our community-based organizations and everybody we work with on the CCP without direct involvement, mandates, legislate, regulate. We really need the time to let those let this thing come together and try to find what works and what doesn't and then share with everybody else our successes and our failures so that everybody else learns from our experiences. Thank you, Sheriff. And, and there'll be a, a acronym mm -hmm. police here, ADP, Average Daily Population. Yes, sir. And CCP is Community Corrections Partnership, right? It's all about acronyms in the Good. state, right? <laughs> That's right. Okay. Uh, so, Matt, you've worn the state hat and the local hat. Uh, you know, what's your perspective on how does this, what should the state do to make this work best? Um, well, I think Senator Hancock uh, truly believes that the legislature won't uh, put their hands in this, um, and she has a lot of control over that. But if it doesn't go well, they, they won't be able to help themselves. It's their job to make sure that to the extent that if crime rates spike, if you know we, we see some disasters happening out there, the pressure is immense on the governor and the legislature to act if things are truly, if things truly break. I think the right message that I heard from the senator and from my colleagues is that it takes time to figure that out. And figuring it out is the hard part. I think if we had to do it over again, we probably would have included a research component to AB 109. Uh, I know that's something that Senator Hancock had her eyes on early on. Uh, it costs money and you've got to think through ahead of time how do you do it and difficult because that's not something the state does on the natural. That's something that, that places like PPIC and academics do. And so it, it was hard to get that to be a fit. But that's the, there's a role there for the state. I think um, you know, as soon as uh, Chief Penner takes over the BSCC, it, you know, we'll be calling her to ask you know, what are you doing and, and can you gather data for us on what's working and what's not. Uh, the great thing about um, running a statewide system is that we had, uh, you know, a, a ability to gather data like crazy. In corrections, there's we had 40, 50 people working in research, you know, gathering data and then disseminating it. And that's true for uh, everything from um, recidivism rates to um, individual information on every offender that left the prison and was on parole that had that that, that had uh, that every one of, of Sheriff Christensen's cruisers had access to well a lot of that stuff has fallen away now that we've kind of gone to this um, system of, of pushing responsibility outward so um, I think that those issues of, of data the issues of, of trying to help um, pull together information on best practices I know that as an association that's something that that um, CSAC has been focused on. How do we pull together, especially with the sheriffs and the chiefs, um, and learn from one another on what's working? How do we work together to get apples to apples data that we can then utilize to make sure that the governor and legislature has the information they need to see that we're moving in the right direction and, and to argue for, for patients even when an individual county may come and say, we need changes now that, that benefit this one place and that, that the other 57 may not like very much. 
And so I, I think that that's the way that the partnership has to be healthy. We have to do our part so that they can do their part and, and forbear the pressure to, to micromanage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to get to one question that I think uh, um, it's probably going to get attention in the coming year, it looks like, um, you know, whether, and that's just the impact on crime rates and, and public safety and what does realignment mean to public safety. And we've seen some of this uh, discussion going on in the media and political rhetoric so far, and it's, it, it may, it's likely or signs are that it might come up over the next couple of uh, next year. And, you know, I just wanted to get from this panel the kind of perspective about how should people think about realignment and crime and uh, what we know, what we don't know, um, you know, to, as the, you know, we go into a discussion about that may very well be about, you know, what does realignment do to crime? So, uh, you know, Sheriff, I wonder if I could start with you on that one. Well, I, first of all, I, the, the thing we can't do is create a unique and definitive nexus between crime rates and realignment. You have to look at a number of different variables. Um, in Stanislaus County, serious and violent crime has not risen, nor has it declined. It's relatively stable throughout the community. But a variable in crime rates is our economy. The last four years has been horrific for everyone, including public safety. Typically in recessions, public safety is bulletproof. I carved 25 percent of our funding resources and staffing out of our budget. Twenty-seven percent of our deputy sheriffs lost their job. So you can't expect to maintain uh, an adequate level of safety and security in the community if you don't have the resources to do it. And frankly, there's a finite amount of money. So that's a variable. Addiction. Horrible, horrible problem in the Central Valley. Methamphetamine is destroying families and children. It's a horribly addictive substance, and it drives property crimes. So we're seeing double-digit increases in property crimes right now, uh, especially in the agricultural community, because in Stanislaus County, in the Central Valley, you know, the agriculture is a multi-billion dollar industry. We feed the world, yet we're seeing tremendous problems with metal theft, equipment theft, product theft, chemical theft. I mean, it's, it's rampant. Um, and even public safety is not immune. We've got an emergency vehicle operations course at the, Crows, the old Crows Landing Naval Air Station, and we had a, a big traffic collision avoidance system set up uh, with traffic lights and signaling and everything else. They took all of that. Just last week, all gone, stolen, because it's metal. You know, they salvaged this. Um, so you take all of those variables, the economy, staffing, resources, you take addiction, you take, I think, to some degree, realignment. Because if, if you have a jail bed capacity problem and you're kicking people out and you have no way to adequately supervise them or provide them the resources and tools they need to be successful, they're going to fall right back into the trap of addiction and they're going to go out and they're going to do what they do to feed their habit. So that's where I see crime rates in Stanislaus County. And again, the final variable in that is the community itself. Again, we partner with the community. The people who live in our communities are as equally helpful in the partnership as law enforcement. We can't be everywhere at once, but I, but I can tell you that active, engaged community members who are ever vigilant, looking out for each other, neighborhood watch, community awareness, public education, crime prevention, if everybody took that extra step to make sure their car was locked, that there was a club on the steering wheel, that you didn't leave anything in plain view, then Modesto, Stanislaus County, probably wouldn't be number one in auto theft again. So I think there are things we can do, again, collectively to help mitigate some of those property crime rates that are occurring right now, as well as crime in general in our communities. Thanks. Matt, I know you've done a lot of study about crime rates and what causes them. What do we know? What well, what I've, what I've learned and, and everything I've read is I can't get two criminologists to agree uh, with one another about what causes, causes crime to move. And I'm sure with the great minds we have in the room, we could start a, you know, probably a knockdown drag out um, on this issue. Uh, I think the sheriff's right. It's complex. It's at least everything that, that he just said. And, and then some, right? And so, 
um, <clears throat> you know, whether it's related to realignment is really difficult to say. There's some common sense that says, well, if there's more people on the street than there used to be, and, you know, uh, Chief Penner and her colleagues aren't turning them all to, to uh, full employment and taxpayers, then you're going to see some additional crime, especially in, in property crime uh, issues, because those are the folks that are getting kicked early. But you have to be careful about that. You know, the, the week before realignment, I went to visit uh, then Mayor Villagorosa, and, and uh, Chief Beck was there. And so I was waiting, and they were having a conversation about, about uh, the chief's report. And the chief said, Mr. Mayor, I'm concerned because we had our arrests went up uh, 100 last week, and I don't know why. And this is about six days before the first day of realignment. And I thought to myself, oh, no. You know, crime's going to go up right before realignment, and everyone's going to blame realignment. Well, uh, if you look across the country, crime is up across the country, and no one knows why. And so, you know, you've got to, that's a huge variable that you have to kind of wrestle with and, and try to figure out. Now, I was also surprised as I was cramming for this that, um, cramming. Um, you know, I was reading this, this uh, excellent little report by um, Magnus and Brandon Martin, and from... Uh, September 2011 to September 2012, there was about 2,500 more releases, jail releases, you know, year to year. That's nothing. I was surprised that number was so low. Um, we, the prisons, we released 10,000 a month before this started. And so it, it's, it's really, it's, there, there has to be some, I assume that there's some connection. But measuring that is really difficult. And all, the, the last thing I'd say about this is this. If we don't start pulling people out of this system completely, it's not going to, ultimately, it's not going to work. So the sheriff's doing his part. He's got to, and the prison system has to do their part in terms of when you're actually in prison, you got to get that, you got to get the rehabilitation started, risk assessments, start figuring out criminogenic needs, start getting people prepared to get out. And then Chief Penner and her colleagues have got to be able to get that handoff. In those first 90 days, they've got to hit that, that hard. Uh, enforcement, rehabilitation, the first 90, 180 days is the whole ball game. And so if we don't start pulling people out of this cycle of crime, then it doesn't matter really how many, if they spend, you know, um, 50 days or 90 days or whatever, right? We're just going to, all that's going to be is just um, a waste of time and money. We've got we've to start reducing recidivism and we've got to start turning, helping people turn around. And, and let us not forget. I mean, we're reactionary to all of this right now. We're trying to make it work. We cannot lose sight of our focus on early intervention and prevention and education. That's a good point. You, 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 you want to you try to stop what's happening, that's where you have to stop it, with young people who get in the system in the first place because they don't have good role models and mentors at home. They find themselves involved in uh, getting engaged in, in addictive substances, primarily, you know, it starts with alcohol and marijuana before you graduate to other forms of addiction. So we've got to stay focused on our young people and the programs available to them to keep them focused on education as opposed to a life of gangs and methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. so, and Chief Penner, can you reality check the real realignment and crime <laughs> issue, that question? You know, it's interesting. I, I'm going to confound you more. In Fresno County, our police chief recently reported that crime was down across the board except for aggravated assaults. Now, he didn't necessarily want to do that because, of course, he was in budget hearings and he would have liked to have said, oh, dear God, money. But he, he did say that. And uh, it is down. I mean, as much as 10% in, in particular categories. So, and, and, and he attributes the aggravated assaults to assaults in the jail. So interestingly enough, I think what you'd see is, is a reduction in crime. I um, can't help but consider right now that um, you know, we realigned three quarters of the juvenile justice population back to the locals uh, three or four years ago. Now what we're seeing is juvenile crime has routinely continued to go down. I'm really hopeful uh, that we're going to see that. Now can you, can you attribute that to juvenile realignment? No, I'm not sure that we have the data points to do that. It's a very global, large look at the picture. But when we talk about data, and we talk about whomever it is that's reading the data or using the data, uh, our police chief uh, 
also indicated at that, uh, at the, we were speaking at the Edwin Brown Institute that maybe crime rates are down in Fresno because we opened three floors of the jail and, uh, and, and our releases are down. So there are so many uh, variables that it's impossible uh, to, to extrapolate from that, you know, a, a meaningful statewide picture. Now, we're going to do that. The BSCC is going to attempt to be able to capture data points that speak to everybody. I'm thrilled about the partnership with PPIC. Um, I think we're going to require partnerships like that all over. It is an enormous job. And beyond that, we have to bring the stakeholders together that 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 are, are going to be able to sit in a room and say, I can live with that. I can live with this. These are data points I can uh, tolerate. I know uh, when uh, Matt was in charge of CDCR, they had a unit of 100 researchers. You know, they had enormous resources spent this way. That's a it's a, it's a huge um, underfunded issue when people want the kind of information that we all want. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. And Senator, how, how should we or how can we think about crime and realignment? Well, if you look at some of the data that I've seen, and I think we're all probably looking at more or less the same thing, crime is still down at a 40-year low in California. It's had a little uptick recently. Um, the, the statistics I show say that it's property crime. One of my police chiefs has told me he thinks it's metal theft, that that's a big thing. And I think it is in the Foothill counties as well. Um, and in fact, we just uh, passed along a bill out of my committee that would ask DOJ to set up a, a, a working group on that and tell us what to do. But still, we're at a 40-year low. This is why we need data, everybody because otherwise we're deconstructing anecdotal evidence <laughs> all the time. And it leads to opportunities to erode the basis for realignment. And I'm only going to say that, uh, you know, I responded to a news story from one of the court-capped counties, horrors, horrors, realignment, murder, uh, found article didn't say it was a court cap county, been court cap for 24 years. And it turned out this particular individual had been, had their uh, probation or parole revoked something like 11 times in the last year without using a risk assessment. And then, yes, there were consequences. Jail management has a lot to do with this. And um, I, um, you know, so I think that yes, we really need to get a set of data that will tell us the information we need. And I'm going to say no more and no less. Because I've asked CDCR, <laughs> maybe you have too, guys, for information in the past and gotten reams of figures that I couldn't decipher. So it was on purpose. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's not true. It wasn't really. But, but what we want. What is a few agreed on data points collected in the same way by everybody so so we know so we have uh, some things to do and I just want to say there are examples of success um, and we can learn from them and we're developing more of them every day and I could not agree more with the sheriff um, and with our pro tem in the state senate and with many of my colleagues agree with this if we don't get to prevention rehabilitation is expensive too prevention and it is my hope that at some point with realignment we will identify these places where a kid goes wrong and we will intervene then for less money less, fewer victims um, and less costs down the road so i think that's what we're trying to get to together Great, thank you. I, uh, so I have many more questions. We could be here all afternoon. There's so much to talk about on this Let's topic. Go. Um, but I, I want to. It's hot outside. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> hot and hotter. I, I want to open it up, and I want to offer the first question to Senator Hancock, uh, um, who had something she wanted yeah. to ask the panel. So. I, I did, because I realized uh, when we were talking about this, about accountability. Because I really do very strongly believe both in partnership, flexibility, and as I said, evaluating on results, not minutia. But what if, what if um, 
Most counties adopt risk assessments, for example, in managing their jail population. So they have the information about who, if they're under a court cap, they might need to let out early. And what if there are a few outlier counties that don't and won't and want to attribute everything to uh, that goes wrong in the county to realignment? At some point, do you think it would be merited, for example, for the legislature to say that um, early releases should be based on a validated risk assessment? So, Matt, do you want to start that one? <laughs> I'll go. Okay, go ahead. Well, again, can't speak uh, for other counties and what they're doing, although our relationship through the State Sheriff's Association is very good and we share information all the time. In Stanislaus County, our partnership with probation, we use the, uh, the Ohio-based risk assessment, assessment tool. We do employ risk <coughs> assessment in our classification process. We employ that risk assessment in who we determine gets diverted to programs versus alternatives to incarceration versus uh, probation supervision. So again, there's actually a number of very, um, what I call well-qualified, experienced, well-trained staff members who sit down and actually do work with people to determine best outcomes, because that's what we're looking for. Um, you know, as the sheriff, am I concerned about the, the accelerated releases that, that we're forced to make? Oh, yeah, because I don't want bad things to happen in my community. Um, so we do our best uh, using that particular tool uh, to assess. And quickly on data, another thing I wanted everybody to know about, and, and the Senator as well, there's been an ongoing effort between the sheriffs and the chiefs and a lot of other stakeholders in data collection and data sharing. Um, again, and I, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but in Stanislaus County, we were prepared to collect data prior to the implementation of realignment. We knew it was coming and we planned for it. So we had our uh, programming teams uh, program our ICGIS systems to make sure that we're able to capture data and use that and share it. And now, again, in partnership with the Department of Justice and our Attorney General, we're doing that at a, at a state level specifically uh, with different systems that house data. So, for example, the probation chiefs uh, enter information into those systems, those database systems on, on, on PRCS offenders and others it goes up to the state supervised release file we're now working with doj to make sure that that data is shared uh, as well so you know i think that's probably how i got involved in this panel discussion at the invitation of the ppic because we've already sat down a couple of times uh, with that team with sonia and others and said here's what we can give you because we do want to know what the results are. We do want to know what the outcomes are. So I, I think that the Senator is absolutely right, but it does have to expand statewide. I would suggest that it's probably better left up to the state sheriffs and CPOC and Cal Chiefs and everybody else to do that rather than it be a legislative mandate. Matt? I, I agree. You know, I think what I've seen as I've gone around the state and visited various counties is that. Um, the vast majority are headed that direction anyway, in terms of, of using risk assessment. Um, I think the probation chiefs um, have made tremendous strides in the last few years. And there's, I don't know if there's any left that aren't using uh, risk assessments. Yeah. I, I think every one of them are. And the sheriffs are, are moving that direction really rapidly. And so my first caution would be, let's make sure we give it enough time. And then my second would be to take on what the senator had said about the legislature's role to provide incentives. And so I know that there are some sheriffs who would love to get a validated risk assessment system if they could afford it. And um, representing the elected supervisors, I know the first words that we teach them are, are unfunded mandate. <laughs> and so, you know, they're immediately going to scream if you say you must, because they're going to say, well, where's the money for that? Um, and maybe rightfully so. But if you say you may, and if you do, you get this extra, you know, lollipop of funding, then you may see that those sheriffs who would like to do this but but feel constrained because their boards can't afford it or whatever we may see those last ones coming on board but um it's been i've been very heartened by the um by the awareness and the sophistication and the earnestness of the local law enforcement officials to 
to adopt best practices and to move in these directions on their own. And so my hope is that if we do this again in a year, we'll say, well, we really are down to the last few, and maybe we can solve those informally, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And Chief Penner, do you have thoughts about risk assessment in the state? And well, you know, the, we're probation. We're, you know, we've, we've been in the uh, data game for a very, very long time, and we've been in the assessment game for a very, very long time. I think that uh, we reckon uh, with the fact that, you know, that is uh, a proven practice, the, the way to do business, and, and we're doing it that way. Um, I'm a big believer in incentivizing rather than, you know, using, you know, the stick, frankly. I think that counties ultimately want to do the right thing. Um, and if we incentivize, I think our, we'll do much better as, as we try to move this sea change forward. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, rule on the side of that rather than legislate uh, individual counties to, to um, assess. Because I, I do believe the desires out there, this is a, uh, a huge shortcoming in the legislation that we did not fund this appropriately. And um, I, I'm not, not to say any of these doors have closed yet. You know, there are a number of cleanup features to AB 109 that are out there that we know have to be addressed. We have to look at long terms. We have to look at split sentences. We have to look at a number of things. I think it is prudent to do what the administration is doing now, which is to let uh, all of this uh, synthesize in a way that we can make great decisions that are well thought out, that, that uh, make a difference instead of acting and reacting too quickly to um, minutia that does not serve the state well. Mm -hmm. and Senator, was that uh, what um, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the dialogue because I think it's true to the extent that it's perceived that there are obvious things that everybody agrees to, like risk assessment, split sentencing, I guess, is another one, and um, that are not being chosen. And in all due respect, I have to say, I, I'm all for incentives, and I want us to get additional incentives written in in various ways. But there was a pile of money given to counties to do this. So the question would be, why did some counties choose to do risk assessments and others couldn't figure out how to do it when there are many models of validated risk assessments out there? And, um, you know, so, it, so that's when it's going to start coming back to the state because, um, and, and the CCPs. And let me just say about the CCPs, having participated in several of them in the counties I represent, and also heard a lot about them from other members. They are the key to this whole thing. And one of the things we're finding is a cultural anomaly in that the law puts prob uh, the chief probation officer in charge of the committee. In point of fact, as I understand it, and Linda can tell me if she doesn't agree, she will, I know, <laughs> um, they uh, often have been used to deferring to sheriffs and DAs who are elected, and they are not. And the sheriffs and DAs and have been really wanting most of the money. And in many, many counties, they're getting the bulk of the money. Is that a bad thing? And there, isn't, <laughs> and there isn't money going to the alternatives, to the rehabilitation, to the risk assessments and jail management, the other things. So um, at some point, we'll probably, and I know there are studies going on on this too, looking at how, how do counties choose to spend that money that the state gives them. So, well, thank you, Senator. We are short on time here, so I'd like to open it up and get a couple questions from the audience. Um, and it, we are going to have to use a microphone because, like I said, this is being live streamed. So uh, if you could ask a question, no speeches, please, and say your name and your affiliation uh, back there first. Over here, there's the, Jen has the microphone. Uh, Chief Penner, my uh, question is for you. It was one of your uh, PRCS offenders who brutally murdered my mom and a Fresno police officer. I just would like to know, what is the criteria that's used to classify these low-level offenders under realignment? Well, first let me say, <clears throat> um, it's heart-wrenching, and uh, my heart goes out to you. I, I, uh, I'm not happy that these sorts of things happen. I think they have occurred across the state in instances that uh, none of us are happy with. Public safety is all of our first um, concern. 
Um, and there are going to be uh, issues that uh, surround uh, this population and populations that are not under any kind of supervision, parole or probation, and our uh, felony probation cases that are going to uh, end up in tragic victimization. So let me start with that. In terms of, I'm, I'm not sure I really understood the question in terms of how, we, how an individual is classified. The legislation itself calls you know, calls for non-non-nons, non-serious, non-violent, non-sex offenders to come to the local um, authorities to supervise. And what we do know, and I suspect what you're uh, inquiring about, is some of those have serious, violent, and sex in their past history. And it is the instant, instant offense that guides the individual to post-release community supervision. Just one more uh, thing I'd like to add is that the offenders Okay. You know, I think what would be great, and if you could at all bring your way, or I'd come to you, I'm happy to talk to you about the, the case itself. And uh, uh, I started my career as a victim advocate and uh, have, have uh, a great empathy, and I think that is why uh, moving this sort of agenda forward, uh, that has always been something in the back of my mind and that I have stayed true to. So uh, let's do that. Good. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yep. So other questions? Uh, yes, right here. I'm Suzanne Reed with Senator Carol Liu. In our community, one of the groups of people that feel kind of left out of the process um, that we find is our local police chiefs. Some of them feel that they haven't been um, engaged uh, with the county and with the sheriff's office in terms of both um, sharing information and um, allocation of funding down to the local level to help them deal with, um, with the additional folks on the street. Can you address that? Mm -hmm. Good question. I guess I'll go. Yeah. Um, I think that goes back to the relationship that you have with your chiefs and the relationship that you have amongst your CCP partners. So again, at the, the risk of sounding like I'm tooting my own horn, we include uh, our chiefs in the CCP in everything we do. I share information with them. Uh, of course, it's a little easier for me. Out of the nine incorporated cities in Stanislaus County, we provide contractual law enforcement services to four. So it's more of a regionalized policing model. But, you know, the, the Modesto Police Department just hired a new chief, uh, Chief Galen Carroll, and immediately I've included him in everything that we're doing, communication, data sharing. Um, we, we embed in Stanislaus County and all of our teams, we embed all of the other agencies in our teams, including probation and parole. I mean, we still have a great working relationship with parole. So I know that's happening in some areas of the state. Frankly, I think it's up to the sheriff and the CCPs to make sure that the chiefs are included. We do allocate uh, funding to the chiefs, primarily overtime costs, so that we can go out and, and do compliance checks and check on people and knock on their door and make sure that they're doing okay. So it does vary from, from county to county. Um, we've made a commitment to include our chiefs in this process, how it affects them. Modesto, of course, being the largest municipal policing organization in Modesto, uh, Chief Galen Carroll is a great partner of mine and we work uh, collaboratively to make sure that uh, we're meeting the, the public's demand for our services because we all know that um, the, the bad guys don't necessarily respect jurisdictional boundaries and what happens in an unincorporated area of the county can certainly happen in the city and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And Matt, do you have thoughts about sheriffs and police? Yeah, I just, I mean, I think the sheriff's right. It, a lot of times it's just personality. And, you know, you got to show up, you got to engage with one another. Um, I think that the legislature provided $25 million last year to the police <laughs> chiefs alone just for them. Uh, on these issues, and part of the problem is, is that you know there are uh, the sheriffs can say, "Here's I got X number of offenders filling X number of my beds," and the chiefs can say, "I've got X number of offenders that I have to supervise," and those required hard dollars. The DA and the public defender can quantify the number of cases that they now have to deal with, 
the, the difficulty with policing is that you're on the streets doing basically the same job, and so it's much more difficult to quantify and argue for exactly how much impact it is. And so my hope is that as the, as, as the sheriffs and, and uh, the county folks who have kind of a, a way to qu quantify that, as those needs get met, then through partnerships you can see um, greater funding down the road. But I think that that's why it's a little bit of a harder sell. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I want to get to one or two more questions before we run out of time. Uh, yes, right here. Hi, Wanda Ruzan from the Attorney General's Office. I keep hearing people talk about funding. What I'd like to know is the precise source of the funding. Is the state going to kick in to all of these additional costs, or are the counties supposed to come up with the additional costs for supervision, such as, say, in probation. Senator, do you have thoughts about where the money comes from? Well, the money basically was diverted from the prison system, from the state general fund, to counties. It's been an ongoing discussion of how the formulas distribute the money to the counties. Uh, I won't go into that unless people are interested in it, but basically it's uh, do the counties who were dependent on the state by sending almost everybody they possibly could to state prison uh, and therefore shifting their costs to the state, did, would those counties get a larger reimbursement because they would have more people coming back than the counties who had shifted many people <laughs> into alternatives to incarceration uh, and rehabilitation, hadn't sent so many people, but were funding on their own county dime already those, pro those alternatives to incarceration. So we've had different formulas going back and forth. We're trying different ones um, to try to get a formula that works. In each county, how they spend the money they're allocated from the state is up to what they're calling the Community Corrections Partnership, which is made up of the chief probation officer who chairs it, the sheriff, the DA, the court administrator, um, a police chief representing the police chiefs in that county, and someone from the public health department in that county. They look at the money that's on the table and um, I'm going to say they often divide it up, and it can turn into little turf silos of who's going to get the money. Uh, Contra Costa County, one of the counties I represent, did what I think was quite an extraordinary thing. They said, let's take our realignment plan, our reentry re plan, talk about how to do the things in that plan, and then talk about which department or agency in the county is best suited to do that work. And um, it seemed to, to work out pretty well, but th it took them a while to get there, but it, it actually was quite an interesting thing, the way it worked out. So the answer is state money uh, given out to counties by a formula, divided up within counties for a mix of services, um, uh, on the basis of the locals. Money is a big question. Local That's decisions. One of the ones this, but we're, we're out of time. And so I, uh, hopefully we answered as much as you can, possibly can what's happening in realignment. Um, and I want hope you will join me in giving me a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.